Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with people who I've connected with over the years in the world of arts and entertainment. And today we're doing another one of our Rock and Roll Stories from the Bar episodes, this time welcoming back David Hinman. Hey, Tommy. Well, how you doing, David? Oh, good, good. I'm, I'm enjoying life up in here in rural Ontario. Yeah. Yeah, you've, uh, I talked to Bob Sagarini a, a while ago, and uh, he was saying that you just keep getting further and further away from civilization, and you won't be surprised <laughs> if you end up on Mars. But anyway, I know you have a nice, peaceful little spot there, and it's, it's nice and comfortable for you and Rose. So yeah. uh, what I want to do, David, is to start this episode off by doing a recap of your overall career in the music business. Now, I'm not sure how many people today are familiar with the original lineup of April Wine, but you were an original founding member. So why don't you fill us in on how that came to be? Yeah, in a, in a sense, uh, I was, there was four of us. It started with Jim Henman, my cousin Jim, who was the bass player in the original band. He and I got together at a, at a tavern in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Well, I think it was Old Orchard Tavern in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. One morning over a pitcher of, of draft beer, and uh, we were bemoaning the you know, we were getting into writing songs. We were getting into original music, and we just weren't getting anywhere with it. You know, we're playing for audiences that would shout out things like, hey, buddy, can you play something we know, eh? <laughs> so we wanted to, you know, kind of take things up a level. And Jim mentioned that uh, he thought he could get Miles Goodwin, who was playing in a band in Cape Breton, North Sydney, Cape Breton, to come and join us. And, of course, I said, well, I've got my brother. He'll play drums. And so that's what we did. Jimmy called Miles, and Miles showed up within a couple of days at the train station with all his possessions in a green garbage bag along with his guitar. (laughs) And we had our first rehearsal in my mom and dad's basement in Lower Sackville, Nova Scotia. I think it was December 1st, 1969. Uh, my mom actually filmed it on an old 8 millimeter, you know, home family camera. But, of course, there was no sound. And it's, you know, on those cameras back in those days, everything looks like it's speeded up. So you can, uh, it's only about 15 seconds long, if that. And it's out there somewhere. I haven't seen it for a long time. But that was how the band formed. And then we did a lot of things around in the four months before we left to go to central Canada. We spent a lot of time getting involved in, in theater, um, for example, in putting on our own shows. We were writing music like crazy. We were all writing music. And a matter of fact, our very first rehearsal, we had decided, well, we were going to take the easy route and we were going to do a mix of cover songs and sneak in some originals. And when we were at our first rehearsal, Miles played a song he was working on and it was kind of a Led Zeppelin riff that he had written for this song. And we just sat there and went, "Uh uh-uh, no covers. We're going all original. And we made that decision at the very first rehearsal just based on the beauty of this riff that Miles played for us. Miles and I were both guitar players. We had kind of gotten past that point of thinking of guitar in terms of rhythm uh, and lead, you know, Mm -hmm. rhythm guitar and lead guitar. We both played rhythm guitar. We both played solos. So uh, I think we consider ourselves more or less equal. As it turned out, Miles was a much better guitar player than me. Yeah, the thing about Miles is his guitar playing. He was an intense guitar player, and it was it was astounding to be on the same stage with him. And I, I would have to say the same about his uh, about his singing, about his vocals. Uh, he was an intense vocalist uh, as well. Well, I don't know about that, David. I mean, we've shared the stage together, and we've done some recording together. And you're a pretty awesome guitarist on your own. I think at this point in my life, I have developed some skills, some uh, some feel for the instrument. But uh, back in those days, no, I was... Uh, here's the thing. Well, here's what it was. Miles was learning from the blues. I really hadn't developed uh, an ear for the blues at that point in my life. I was 20 years old. And Miles, in his teens, 
had already been studying blues guitar. That's a in rock and roll. That's a biggie, as you as you know. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So April Wine is formed, and you're doing all original material. Now that's got to be a challenge, um, especially economically when you're starting out. Well, we were really ended up in the right place at the right time. We drove to Montreal on April first, nineteen seventy. And Quebec was, if you were playing original music in Canada, Quebec at that time was the place to be. Quebec audiences are traditionally, and you know, this was during the time of FM radio when Quebec audiences were breaking bands like Super Tramp and many, many others before anybody else. Quebec audiences at that time, and probably still the same, were just more just more open. We were accepted right away. We were playing obscure kind of stuff, stuff that changed tempo in the middle of the song and, and uh, songs that were kind of a pastiche of four or five other songs and, and very, very experimental. A lot of it not commercial at all. And Quebec audiences didn't care. They, they just loved you. If you got up on stage and you put your heart and soul into your music, that's all they required. You know, we, right away, we, within months, we were working steadily. We got, we got uh, hooked up with the uh, Donald K. Donald Agency, Terry Flood Management. Wait a minute, there's a story there about the Donald K. Donald Agency, isn't there? I mean, uh, you told me before something like you guys made the drive from the East Coast to Montreal on uh, False Promise. We made the drive based on false information. Right. <laughs> our, our agent in, in Halifax told us that he had talked to Donald about us and that Donald was expecting us and, and uh, <laughs> couldn't be further from the truth. And we ended up going to uh, a club. When we got to Montreal, we went to a club called Lapin that Donald and Terry owned, and it was a club for musicians to hang out, especially the musicians that were signed to their management and promotion uh, deals. So we, we called the office and we, we asked to speak to Donald and they said, oh, Donald's at this club called Lapin. There's a press conference. So we, you know, we immediately showed up at Lapin. We were there before anybody else. We walked in and we said, we're here to see Donald. And the, uh, the bartender said, well, would you like a drink? And we said, oh, okay. <laughs> and, and so we got a free drink and we sat at our table People started coming in, and then they had a dais set up on stage. And I think at that moment in time, we actually deluded ourselves into thinking that this was all for us. <laughs> That's how naive we were <laughs> back then. Anyway, turned out it was um, a press conference where they wanted to stage a Woodstock-style festival. And this was a press conference to talk about it. So anyway, when the press conference ended, Donald walks up the aisle. So I stood up and I said, hi, Donald, I'm David Henman. We're April Wine. And uh, he looks at me and he goes, uh, okay, well, give me a call at the office on Tuesday. <laughs> so, so, so we did. But the thing was, our naivety actually worked in our favor. Donald, just he just loved us. He thought we were just the most wet behind the ears band that he had ever encountered. He, he just he, he thought it was a great novelty. So he did uh, take us seriously. He, he just really liked the band and, and everybody else at the, uh, at the offices seemed to like us. So we were, we were kind of taken under his wing right away. Uh, we didn't have any money. And I went begging. I walked into his office and said, Donald, we don't have any money. And, you know, he, he made a big show of standing up and reaching into his pocket, taking out a $50 bill putting it across, handing it across the desk to me. <laughs> and, you know, that was the thing. They just really adopted us, and we became a, a Donald K. Donald, Terry Flood band. They got us a record deal. They got us a publishing deal. And next thing you know, we had lawyers and everything else. Now, take us back to where the name April Wine came from. Well, it was, it was basically that meeting with my cousin at that Old Orchard Tavern in in Dartmouth, and then we just uh, we started rehearsing right away. We just felt uh, a friendship and a, 
a rapport with each other right away. We did some theater productions. There was a, a Neptune Theater in Halifax. They were doing a, you know, a, an ancient play that they were doing, and they wanted us to do the music for it. And we did some other productions. We didn't really, I can't remember us playing bars. Because we were playing original music, we wanted to do places. Like, I think we did a couple of shows at universities and art theaters and things like that. But mostly we just wanted to write and rehearse, write and rehearse. And within four months of forming the band, we got to Montreal. Right away, they got us a band house that was a ski, uh, like a ski cabin up in the Laurentians, up in St. Sever, that was not being used. So that right away, we, we had a band house. So, you know, there we were. First thing we would put on the record player when we get up in the morning was Led Zeppelin 1 or Led Zeppelin 2. And the last thing we would put on the record player before we went to bed at night was Led Zeppelin 1 or Led Zeppelin 2. And we followed that path for the first few months, I think, of, of uh, listening to Led Zeppelin and then writing songs inspired by those Jimmy Page riffs uh, kind of thing. But, you know, like I say, Donald K. Donald and Terry Flood, they got us working right away. My brother has, um, you should interview Richie if you ever get a chance, because he's the one that has the memory. But he has computer printouts of all of those gigs all those shows that we did for the first couple of years, where we played, how much we made, and all the rest of it, all of those uh, details. It's... Editor's note, after we finished recording this interview, David connected me with his brother Richie, and we also had a very interesting conversation, which you will hear on the next full episode of Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. Now back to David. Boy, we worked. <laughs> we were doing you know, a show in a different city every day, sometimes two shows. And for that first couple of years, boy, we were working in Quebec mostly. But then we started touring in Ontario. We played at everybody's high school across Canada. And, of course, that's the thing that you hear in mo- every band from that era. If you're Rush, if you're Guess Who, if you're the Stampeders, if you're whoever, the one thing you've heard most in your career is, oh, you guys played at my high school. <laughs> Right, but I'd like to get back to how the name April Wine was created, if we can. Oh, that was me, and it was just, um, you know what it was? Everybody at that point was called The, you know, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones. And there was a new trend in naming bands with two words, like Jefferson Airplane, Moby Grape, Grateful Dead. And we wanted to get on that bandwagon of putting two words together to form a band name. And I just thought that uh, I was a very romantic young man. (laughs) And I thought that April Wine had a very kind of romantic um, connotational context, uh, very romantic feel to it. The only other thing was we liked the name April Wine because it didn't give anything away. Like Led Zeppelin kind of indicated that was a heavy rock band. We didn't want to box ourselves in like that. So we wanted a name that would not kind of prejudice the listener into thinking that the, the, the name, you know, indicated anything about the style of the band's music. Right. And that, that worked because, I mean, over the years, April Wine has played a wide variety of styles. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's been a yeah. very apropos name for sure. Yeah. 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 So yeah, Miles hasn't. We didn't limit ourselves in the beginning, and as the band went on, I don't think Miles really limited himself to. Uh, I mean, I don't think you know, Miles really ever got into like doing, say, you know, soft jazz or anything like that. But he really, you know, his his own work and in his solo his solo work in an April Wine. It's pretty broad spectrum of styles, and then of course now he's become a real. The blues aficionado. So yeah, he's a. April Wine was uh, never in the same category as, say, an ACDC. Now, ACDC has been somewhat criticized for you know every song being, but that's their style. Yeah. And they've been very successfully locked into it. And I remember reading an interview with Neil Sean from Journey, where he said he felt really bad for Angus that he had to play the same style all the time. 
And as successful as that style has been for ACDC over the years, April Wine has never been boxed in in that way. Yeah, yeah. Although a lot of those guys, when they're not playing, when Angus is not playing with ACDC, I wonder if he sits around playing flamenco guitar. I think I remember Neil Sean saying that he's jammed with Angus. Uh, and now oh, this is like I don't know, probably 20 years ago that I was reading this article in a guitar magazine, but... Neil was saying that Angus was a lot more versatile than what you would ever hear on the records. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, I don't think that's unusual. You know, Frank Marino is a good example of that. He does his thing with Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush, but anybody who knows him will tell you that he can sit in the dressing room and play just about anything you want to hear, anything you can imagine on the guitar. Well, let's hope he's uh, able to do that for a while. I mean, I, he's not doing that great health-wise these days but uh yeah yeah i don't uh, i don't know too much about it but uh there's something going on there it's probably probably best left alone it's a private uh, yeah private yeah no, he's he's uh, he's made some statements general vague statements about his health and i think he went so far as to saying that he's retiring from the music business but yeah you know, well wish him well anyway oh boy no kidding yeah so now after april wine you had some different experiences, and uh, I know that you played with Bob Sigarini. Yeah, we. Uh, the first thing that happened after April Wine, I had moved. I had, I had gotten married. I had moved to Toronto. This was in 1973, and I got a phone call from Bob Sigarini, and he said, "We're I'm putting together a, a kind of a super group." But the idea was he told me who he was talking to. It was my brother, Richie. It was Brian Greenway, who would go on to become a guitar player here for Wine later on. And then Wayne, another, it was a band with two drummers, three guitar players, and a bass player. And oh, well, actually, there was a keyboard player originally, but he was a real kind of vanilla kind of character that just didn't fit. Uh, so he, he didn't make it past the first, I don't even think he made it to the first gig. I mean, it was six guys, <laughs> two drummers and four guitar players. And my wife at the time, I, you know, I just told Bob I'd think about it and uh, hung up the phone and I turned to my wife and I told her what the phone call was all about. And she was like, oh, <laughs> you have to do this. So we moved back to Montreal to put this band together called originally called All the Young Dudes. I think eventually it's shortened to the Dudes. Right. And uh, you want to know more about that? Yeah, yeah. And we will have to hear the rest of that conversation and the other things that David and I talked about during this interview in Episode 75, David Henman Rock and Roll Stories from the Bar, Part 2. You're going to like it. Now, meanwhile, here is a brand new release by Henman Rose. This is David Henman with his partner Rose and their latest release called Seeds of Hope and Joy. Be the strength. 
Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including producing, editing, guest acquisition, etc. All rights reserved. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends was written and recorded by Tommy Solo with a little help from my friends in the night crew. And hey, if you like the show, why not subscribe? Until next time, cheers.